Today on Government Matters, the Air Force's milestone achievement for fighting the future fight. Two Air Force veterans tell you why it's such a huge deal. Inspectors General in the spotlight on Capitol Hill. Two former IGs explain what all the attention really means. And the number one story of the week, the cyber floodgates open for good and for bad. Two cyber experts break down which is which. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Francis Rose. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news, trends, and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm your host, Francis Rose. A huge step is in place now for the Air Force's Advanced Battle Management System. ABMS lays the groundwork for the system that connects all of the services together, Joint All Domain Command and Control. General Hawk Carlisle, U.S. Air Force retired as president and CEO of the National Defense Industrial Association. He's former commander of Air Combat Command. Deborah Lee James was the 23rd secretary of the Air Force. She is author of Aim High, Chart Your Course, and Find Success. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for coming on the program. Madam Secretary, I start with you and this quote from Breaking Defense. Congress has been deeply skeptical of ABMS, chopping the service's budget request nearly in half in the 2021 defense appropriation. What would you like to see the Air Force do to solidify Congress's belief and support for ABMS? Well, first of all, happy Independence Day to you, Francis, and to all of our military viewers around the world, and to you as well, General Carlisle. Good to see you both. Um, I would say this is a little bit the story of you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, because, of course, Congress and many in DOD and many in the private sector as well have been calling upon DOD to do acquisition strategies in more new and innovative ways. And the Air Force has been approaching this in a new and innovative way. They've been doing on-ramp experiments, trying to use off-the-shelf technologies to see whether those off-the-shelf technologies actually give the warfighter an edge before committing to a full-up acquisition program. And yet that hasn't played too well because Congress has said it's too nebulous and where's the acquisition strategy and you know where is our money going and where is the roadmap and so on. So now the Air Force is prepared to pivot a bit and um, I think the, the pivot is a good idea. It's designed to, to uh, bring Bring in more what they're calling hard capabilities to be able to demonstrate value add to Congress. The very first one will be some communications pods on the KC-46 tanker, which will allow the tanker to fly in tandem with the F-22 and F-35 and act as a form of a cell tower so that those two, mach those two aircraft, which currently cannot communicate, will be able to do so in the future. So the focus will be hard capabilities and the objective is to demonstrate the value out of the program to Congress in more tangible ways. General Carlisle, welcome. It's good to see you again as well. The headline that Val and Cine uses in Defense News to describe what the Secretary just described is the Air Force's new ABMS strategy, buy new capability now regarding those KC-46 pods. How is this different than what the force has done in the past? Uh, well, uh, Francis, great to see you. And Madam Secretary, it's great to see you as well. And again, happy uh, Independence Day to everybody. You know, I think it, it's, the, it's the spiral technique that Secretary talked about is the idea that, you know, you, you have to determine w from where you're at, because we obviously are engaged to, around the globe and we have a command and control system today uh, and how do we grow that and spiral capability into that and tie it to the joint uh, fight? You know, there's a ABMS in the Air Force, there's Project Convergence in the Army, there's Project Overmatch in the Department of the Navy. And so part of that is that integrated joint all domain command and control. So really what the Air Force is doing is spiraling capability to move us from today's command and control architecture to what we know we need to be able to do in a JADC2 environment with spiraled capability. Yet this uh, KC-46, that allowed the F-22 and F-35 talk, which includes the Navy F-35s and the Marine F-35s, and we'll get further into Patriots and Aegis and ground systems. So it's really that spiral capability to move us into what we know we have to be able to do in the future of JADC2. Hawk, I'm going to put you back in the command chair for a moment. What are the conversations that you would have with the acquisition team um, right now led by General Bunch to make sure that that team is delivering the capability that you and your warfighters need? 
Yeah, Ar Arnie Bunch is a great guy. He's a good friend of mine. And what I tell him is, you're doing great work, but it's not fast enough. You got to do it faster. And, and I think we know in our environment and the way we do acquisition in the United States, it, and, and for very good reasons, there's a natural tension between uh, free enterprise and industry and the taxpayer dollars. Um, but we got to figure out a way to do it quicker. We got to get capability into the hands of these young women and men faster. And we know that uh, in the command and control, which is not a hard, you know, hardware piece, which makes it even more difficult, as Secretary James said, because you can talk about an F-35 or a cruiser or a submarine or a, a combat vehicle, uh, but to talk about the linkage between all those to connect sensors and shooters and build that network, that's a little bit harder to talk about. And that's one of the reasons I think Congress has looked at it the way they have. But what we need to do in the acquisition process, again, exactly what Secretary James said, is we have to do it faster. We've got to find new and innovative ways to do it more quickly. Uh, Debbie, your successor, Frank Kendall, and you, when you were the Secretary of the Air Force, kind of pioneered this idea of buying off the shelf. The Trump administration continued that. Is this something more broadly across the force, not specific to ABMS necessarily, that you expect to see a lot more of out of your force? Absolutely. Uh, that's what the spiral development, these innovative approaches are all about. The idea of prototyping more things before you commit to a full up acquisition strategy to see what actually can work and then to rapidly get it to the warfighters. So we've been saying for years that there's fantastic technology out there in the commercial world. We need to make it easier for some of those non-traditional companies in particular to do business with the DOD so that we can get access to that commercial technology and then see what works for us and what does not. And by the way, the experimentation process that the Air Force was doing originally, I don't think that's a bad approach. I think that's a good approach. But again, if Congress can't see it, feel it, touch it, and if the hundreds of millions of dollars that's being requested for ABMS is in competition with platforms, which they can see and touch and feel, and there's jobs associated with it, it becomes a hard sell. So this is what the Air Force is grappling with now, trying to tell the story, trying to get the resources, solidifying support for a program, which many of us, most of us think is really foundational for the future of our uh, war fight. Secretary James, General Carlisle, it's wonderful to see both of you. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Francis. Thanks, Francis. Great to see you, my friend. Coming next, Inspectors General in the spotlight on Capitol Hill. Straight ahead on Government Matters, two former IGs explain what all the attention really means. You're watching 7 News. Welcome back. Inspectors General could keep working even if the government shuts down again and one member of Congress wants IGs across government to evaluate how well remote work really worked. John Reimers, principal at Lynch Consultants, former inspector general at the Department of Defense. Dan Levinson's former IG at the Department of Health and Human Services in the General Services Administration. Gentlemen, welcome. It's great to see both of you. Dan, I start with you. What, what happens during a shutdown in historically to inspector general offices that this bill might prevent? Well, Francis, as a general matter, uh, I would think that most IGs are affected by the discretionary spending uh, that is, is the heart of a close down. But with HHS, actually, uh, my experience personally as the IG there was that we were minimally impacted by it because so much of health and human services monies go to Medicare and Medicaid funding, which is mandatory. So. Uh, our our particular IG office was far less impacted by this than most others. But I think it's a very important reform uh, to allow IG offices to continue to work uh, because the nature of what these offices do, and the bread and butter, of course, are audits and criminal investigations, are matters that really depend upon continuity of operations for to be most effective. Uh, it's a uh, it's an addition to uh, IG function that would be very very valuable. John, welcome. It's good to have you on the program again. Uh, what do you see as the benefits, and are there potential challenges that uh, a, a continuing operations during a shutdown might present? Well, certainly, and and I would agree with uh, with Dan in terms of continuing operations and how critical they can be. But 
Um, in my experience, I, I worked through, I had just recently been appointed at the time, uh, the, la the, the, the last shutdown there in the Obama administration. Uh, and my experience was that after authorities became more clearly defined in the first two or three days of that shutdown between what authority I had as the IG versus what authority the secretary had to determine which employees were essential and which weren't. Once that was really uh, established and it, the determination was that I really had the same authority relative to IG employees that the secretary had to the rest of the department, uh, I had the discretion then to decide which employees were essential, in other words, which one, which essentially investigations needed to continue, uh, which audits or investigations could be delayed. Uh, but it is, as Dan said, critical that, uh, that a certain amount, if not all of the IG workforce remain available to, to protect, um, protect uh, sensitive information, protect in our case, some, in some cases, equipment, weapons, things of that nature. So. Continuing oper the ability to continue the work uh, of an IG is very important during the shutdown. The work of the IG uh, in any given agency, John, as Dan laid out, is audits and investigations. How would one conduct such an audit or investigation into how remote work worked? Uh, Congressman Jody Heiss of the House Oversight and Reform Committee is asking um, 10 agency IGs to do that, as I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation. How would one go about assessing the success of remote work in the, during the pandemic? Well, time and remote work, um, assessing uh, how effective it's been or assessing whether people are actually performing the work, uh, that nature, that, that whole issue is, is really round, wound up in, in time and attendance fraud, which has really been essentially low hanging fruit in IG offices for many years. It's not been very difficult if some were, one were abusing, uh, uh, in other words, filing hours to saying they worked when they didn't work, it was fairly simple to investigate that. A little bit more complicated now that since many folks aren't actually in the workplace, so the ability to, to check a card reader and see if someone had actually swiped into the building and was available, uh, that's not available to us, but there are a, a number of other ways um, uh, with a, such a large electronic footprint that every employee leaves every day. There are a number of ways to 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 look at productivity or look at how in, engaged an employee was during the course of the day. Whether it's whether it's uh, so government cell phone records, uh, email use, uh, use of other applications on on the uh, um, in the systems in the department's technology a whole host of ways that, that an IG investigator could determine if someone was really really engaged in performing productive work on behalf of the government. Dan, how would you go about digging into that from an IG perspective? How would you measure this person was this productive, this person was that productive, and we add it all up to figure out whether we were as productive uh, post-pandemic, you know, post-remote uh, work as we were before? You know, I think it's so important, Francis, to take a deep breath and think about the transformation that's going on in workplaces, both in the public and the private sector. The time and attendance rules that John very properly referenced and we talk about, these are mid 20th century rules uh, that were really key to being able to monitor uh, the kind of work that, uh, that the workplace did especially with wage grade, but as well with the general schedule. Uh, we deal far more these days with knowledge workers uh, in a technology environment that really does allow work to be performed across a variety of different venues. And it's so important for the federal government uh, to become more comfortable and to operate more effectively and efficiently with 21st century technology by taking whatever lessons can be learned from the private sector with respect to remote work and thinking through in a sophisticated way because IG offices themselves are full of knowledge workers. You know, we, these offices have attorneys, uh, professional accountants, criminal investigators, and professional evaluators. These are sophisticated jobs that can be done in a variety of different places. And when the job needs to get done at a particular place, 
Uh, these people are very good at being able to figure out where that needs to happen. And I think that's probably true across many areas now of the federal government. Gentlemen, thanks very much for your time. It always goes by very quickly. I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Francis. Up next, the number one story of the week, $47 billion for cyber resiliency. Straight ahead on Government Matters, two experts tell you where the money should go and for what. You're watching 7 News. Welcome back. Now, the number one story of the week. The White House's infrastructure deal includes $47 billion for cyber resiliency. That money would be the biggest investment in resilience ever. Essie Miller is CEO for Executive Business Management. She's former Principal Deputy Chief Information Officer at the Department of Defense. Suzanne Spaulding is Senior Advisor of Homeland Security at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She's former Undersecretary at the National Protection and Programs Directorate at the Department of Homeland Security. Security. Friends, welcome. It's good to see both of you. I mentioned the infrastructure deal. My dilemma is in choosing the number one story of the week, they were all cyber and it was hard to choose among them. We have the hold on Jen Easterly uh, at, at CISA, uh, Suzanne's former organization, and we have the confirmation of Chris Inglis to become national cyber director. Essie, I start with you. How do we sort all of these out and choose which are the ones that people in government should pay the most attention to? Francis, I think we've got to look at the whole picture. It, this is an ecosystem of sorts. You need the leadership in place. Now that you have the attention and the resources going toward this, and while Ann and team are doing a great job pushing ahead on the executive order, bringing Jen in with her government, industry, and Intel background will be great to put the strategic plan in place. I counter that with the dollars that the agencies need to improve their response and capabilities is important as well. So you've got to have leadership and the resources are critical and you bring that all together, I think, to have an impact. Suzanne, do you sort these all of these issues out in the same way Essie does? Absolutely, uh, Essie's got it exactly right. Of course, in doing that, she <laughs> avoided your question, which was what's the most important. Uh, part of that story, um, but she's absolutely right. All of those things are essential. Uh, I do think that for this week, uh, the two most important stories probably are Chris Inglis's confirmation and what didn't happen, which was the confirmation of Jen Easterly. I do think it is urgent to get that leadership in place. Uh, the career folks who are running CISA today are very competent. They're doing a great job. But there's only so much they can do without a political leadership, particularly when they know that you know it's it's pending. So a lot of decisions continue to be pending as well. And so we really do need to make that happen. Um, like Essie, I was really pleased to see the resources, at least in the you know couple of bills that in the House and the Senate. And now we're we're still a, I worry a long way from getting that enacted, and we need to move forward on getting some something that the Congress can actually enact and the president can sign. I note, Suzanne, that Chris is in place, obviously, and Jen's hold is not to anything to do with her. It's a, a separate issue completely removed even from the cybersecurity realm. What do you take from the fact that the people that the administration's choosing have such experiences as he alluded to? It's terrific. They're both such great choices. Uh, I served, of course, with Chris Inglis on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, and so I, I got to see him up close and personal, and he and I also were in the administration at the same time um, years ago. Uh, and he is just a brilliant choice. He's incredibly smart. He His temperament is exactly the right kind of temperament to try to bring that inner agency together to get people to have the trust, level of trust, and move decisions forward, initiate true interagency planning. He's just going to be a great choice. And Jen uh, brings not only the credibility from her time at NSA, which is going to be important because that's a key partner for CISA, but her time in the private sector. And she was also a key uh, advisor to the Solarium and uh, just a, such an expert in this area. Uh, she's got exactly the right combination of, of skills and talents. and. Um, I couldn't be more pleased with their choices. Essie, I went back and looked and, and listened, 
And in a demonstration of how little impact this program must have, three different people said that the best choice for national cyber director was Suzanne Spaulding. Obviously, she didn't get the gig, had nothing to do with my ability to influence anything. But what do you expect to see Chris do to coordinate across both the civilian agencies and your former agency of DOD as national cyber director? You know, Francis, there's been a lot of conversation over you know, whether we should merge agencies or how we bring them all together. I think Chris will be in a great position to coordinate touch points across all of the agencies and bringing the best that each of them have based on their mission and capabilities to bear. He'll also be a great partner in messaging to our industry partners and what we need from them and how they can help. And I think that's all very important. We have about 30 seconds left, Essie. What would you watch moving forward? Suzanne, I want to ask you the same thing. What would you watch, Essie? Where the dollars flow and what we're doing with them, how the agencies are better postured to execute their mission while protecting infrastructure. Suzanne, how about you? Yeah, once again, SE has it exactly right. It's going to be critically important that the resilience money that we see in these bills uh, around infrastructure stays in that that it stays at high levels because it's both physical and cyber resilience they are in, they are inevitably connected to each other Suzanne Spaulding Essie Miller thanks very much great to have you both on the program Thanks Francis. great to be here thanks Francis Don't forget if you miss an episode of Government Matters it's at govmatters.tv you get a preview and a recap of every show when you sign up for our daily newsletters just enter your email in the red box on the website. I'm back in two minutes. And that's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 11 on WJLA 24-7 News and next Sunday morning at 1030 on 7 News to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the business of government. Thanks for watching. Happy Independence Day. I'm Francis Rose.